somber procession as Queen Elizabeth left Buckingham Palace for the final time. The royal family escorted her, walking her flag-draped coffin to Westminster Hall, where the public is now paying their respects. Lines are stretching for miles as people wait to say their final goodbyes. Looming fears that the nation's already struggling supply chain could be stretched even further by a possible rail strike. It's already impacting passenger travel. The White House and members of Congress are now trying to find a solution before it's too late. President Zelensky makes a surprise visit to newly reclaimed territory. The role the U.S. and its allies had in helping to build this momentum and what we're learning about possible evidence of Russian war crimes. A scandal involving football Hall of Famer Brett Favre a new report alleges text messages link him to the misuse of welfare funds. The complicated history between the royals and the Commonwealth. While some are remembering Queen Elizabeth fondly, others say her legacy is forever linked to colonialism. We have to talk about building a relationship that is based on an equal power dynamic have conversations that recognize the power that our region brings to your region. Celebrating Hispanic heritage with a performer whose hard work and success has opened doors for generations to come. One, two, three, four, come on, baby, say you love me, five, six, seven. Gloria Stefan reflects on her childhood, her groundbreaking career, and what being Cuban-American means to her. I always say I was replanted in American soil, but I was watered with Cuban sun and Cuban water. Telling a refugee story in his own way. Comedian Mo Ammer tells us about his Netflix series and how it's inspired by his own experiences. Although it's a refugee story, it's a Asylee story, it's an immigrant story, it's a universal one. Anybody that struggles, that tries to take care of their family, is, uh, you know, hustling day and night, trying to, trying to make it happen for them. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the Queen's final journey and the remarkable scene in London as a city and a country says farewell. The Queen's casket left Buckingham Palace for the final time today, and tonight the line of mourners waiting to pay their final respects stretches on for miles. The Queen's casket departed the palace this morning for the short journey to Westminster Hall. Her family walking behind King Charles III and his siblings, Princess Anne and Princes Andrew and Edward, and behind them, the King's sons, Princes William and Harry. Thousands of silent residents line the route. The solemn scene as rounds of bells tolled. And at this hour and every hour until 6.30 Monday morning, people are filing by her casket at Westminster Hall, where it will remain until the funeral. Authorities have warned those who have lined up to pay their respects that they may have to wait up to 30 hours in order to get to the front. Tomorrow, King Charles will observe a day of rest and reflection. Our chief foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, leads us off tonight from London. Tonight, Queen Elizabeth II leaving Buckingham Palace, her childhood home, one last time. She was head of a family, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, but also head of a nation. And now the British people have a chance to say a last goodbye to their queen. At 2.22 exactly, a gun salute, as the cortege made its sombre march to Westminster. The toll of Big Ben marking every solemn minute. Against a deep blue sky, even the plane stopped flying for a few brief moments. As the Queen's coffin, draped in the royal standard, topped with the imperial state crown, was led from the palace on a gun carriage. That crown, steeped in royal history, worn by a young Elizabeth on her coronation day almost 70 years ago, and now marking the end of her historic reign. King Charles walking directly behind his mother, as the procession moved past thousands of mourners, faces of love and loss. The weight of this moment etched on the new king's face and following behind his son, Prince William, now the heir to the throne, and Prince Harry alongside, a family in sadness and reflection. The two brothers walking together, a reminder of that heartbreaking procession 25 years ago when as young boys, they walked behind their mother's casket. And Princess Anne, who's been with her mother on every step of this final journey, marching side by side with her brother, the King. 
And as the coffin passed by, a ripple of spontaneous applause moved through the crowd. The cortege arriving at the Palace of Westminster. The choir singing Psalm 139 as the Queen was brought to rest in Westminster Hall. The extended royal family there, the Queen Consort at the King's side, one by one pausing before the casket. The Queen will lie here in state until her funeral Monday. Nearly a million people expected to pay their respects to the only monarch until now most of them have ever known. So many feeling that deep connection to the Queen. Ian Panel joins us now from London. Ian, it's really hard to fathom just how many people showed up today for the procession and who are now waiting in line. What has the sentiment, the feel been like in London today? Yeah, I think it's been a mixture of emotions, Lindsay. Uh, I mean, it's interesting, Buckingham Palace is now quiet, and it was such an intense but also silent scene earlier. I mean, I haven't heard London this quiet since the height of the pandemic. Even the planes that normally would be flying over here on their way to Heathrow Airport, they were temporarily suspended and paused so they weren't flying over, disturbing the silence. It's a mood of expectation, a, a mood of mourning, a mood of contemplation, but also some senses of celebration, of appreciation for the Queen's life and as the carriage pushed on through there was this kind of ripple of applause that moved its way through the crowd now that's obviously just a scene here many other people around the country will have very different emotions uh, and we're going to see more of that i think over the next four days it's a time in some senses for reckoning people looking back the queen was the link between so many people in britain and the past between uh, the modern day and the second world war between a different era that has now disappeared. I think there's that sense of a void uh, and questions about what is now going to fill that. Of course, we now have a new monarch. Uh, he has got a very tough act to follow and we're gonna have to see what passes. But I think for the next few days, it will be contemplation, uh, it will be reflection, some mourning, uh, but also appreciation for a life served for the nation. Lindsay? And reckoning and reflection. Ian Panel, our thanks to you as always. We've seen so much ceremony and tradition in these past few days, and we'll certainly continue to see a lot more of it. Let's bring in ABC News contributor Omid Scobie to talk more about these next few days and this new era. King Charles is planning to take a day from the public eye tomorrow and, and rest and reflect. It's been certainly a long time since a monarch died, but is this a normal practice, or did he possibly insist that he needs to take some personal time to grieve? Well, of course, in recent days, we've seen King Charles sort of zigzag his way across the country. And it's no doubt an emotionally and physically draining time for him. But of course, there are also constitutional matters to take care of. He's taken on one of the biggest jobs from his mother. And so alongside resting, uh, at home. He'll also be looking after the red boxes full of state papers. Those are the government documents on issues that need to be signed off, discussed, or at least inform the king about. So this is very much him sort of continuing the work and allowing other family members to step in as well. And who will we see taking the lead tomorrow while the king is at rest? Well, it's very interesting, Lindsay, because, of course, prior to Charles taking over, we did wonder what that slimmed-down vision for the monarchy that he had would be. There were talks that he wouldn't involve some of his siblings, but we've had word from Buckingham Palace that the Earl and Countess of Wessex will be stepping in to help in Manchester tomorrow. That's Edward and Sophie, Edward, of course, being Charles's brother. They'll be working across the city, lighting a candle at one of the local cathedrals in the Queen's name. They'll also be signing a book of condolences and seeing some of the many flowers that have been left across the city for her. So this is very much a family effort at this difficult time. And we've seen the royals wearing military uniforms several times at this point. Will there be more ceremonies that require them to do so? And who should we expect to see wearing them versus not? Well, Lindsay, we had word from Buckingham Palace that, of course, the working members of the royal family will be in their military uniform throughout the ceremonial events over the days ahead. But there has been an exception made for one non-working member of the family, that's Prince Andrew, for that final vigil at Westminster Hall. He'll be allowed, as a sort of tribute to his mother, of course, was also the head of the armed forces, to wear his uniform for that moment. But there has also been a lot of talk about Prince Harry, who, of course, served 10 years in Afghanistan and for the armed forces 
horses isn't allowed to wear his. Now, Harry's himself responded to that. He said in a statement that it, the uniform doesn't make us the veteran and that for him, it's all about keeping the focus on the Queen and he doesn't want people focusing on this particular omission. Of course, you're in London right now. There are long lines to see the Queen as she lies in state, and we saw thousands watching the procession today. Is all the support that we're seeing reflective of how most people in the UK feel about the royals? Yeah, Lindsay, right now, I think the queue to be one of those individuals that get a chance to walk past the Queen lying at state in Westminster Hall is two and a half miles long. Wow. Now, many of those are the monarchists of this country. These are the people that have lived and breathed the lives of the royal family. But I think there's also an element of curiosity as well. For many people, they just want to be part of history. I think no matter how you feel about the monarchy in the UK, there is a love and adoration for the Queen. And so for everyone who has the chance they do want to go there and show their respects. And we're certainly seeing a lot of the royal family lately, but King Charles is believed to favor fewer royals in the spotlight, as you said, that slimmed down version. So following the funeral, who do you think that, that we'll see um, more of and, and perhaps not so much of? Well, once upon a time, over a decade ago, when Charles first sort of put forward his ideas for a slimmed down monarchy, he pictured one, both of his sons being part of it. Of course, now the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan, aren't part of that. So he'll be looking at other family members, like we see tomorrow with Edward and Sophie, to really step in and support him as he carries out his reign. We'll also be looking at other family members who may not necessarily rank high on the line of succession, Princess Anne, who's currently 16th in line to the throne, but there's a huge amount of support for her in this country and Charles will no doubt be looking to her to support him over the years ahead. Omid Scobie, our thanks to you as always. Back here at home to a story that everyone needs to be tracking closely, our nation's railroad system could in essence grind to a halt as soon as Friday. A looming strike, if it's not averted, could have far-reaching implications for our supply chain and the price of goods. Amtrak is already moving to cancel routes and farmers across the country are concerned. Our transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez, reports. Tonight, a race against the clock to stop a supply chain crisis and travel nightmare, with 60,000 rail workers threatening to strike tomorrow at midnight. Amtrak now canceling its long-distance trips on 14 routes. Nearly all of its trains outside the Northeast Corridor would be impacted with possible shutdowns of local commuter lines. I was like, oh my God, how am I going to get to work next week? Nearly a third of the freight in this country is moved by rail. Everything from oil to cars to crops. Farmers like Tom Waters are worried. There's a lot of fear. We need government to step in and do something about this. He needs to move wheat out of grain elevators to make room for beans and corn before they die in the fields. Americans are already facing sky-high prices, and experts warn a strike could cripple a stressed supply chain. It means that you could see empty shelves at your store where goods that were supposed to get there just could not get there. If it goes on for any length of time, it starts to spin out of control fairly quickly. Railroad companies have shed thousands of workers in recent years with profits soaring. Washington trying to broker a deal. The main area of disagreement is that there's no sick leave for the, the workers, and that's a problem. Workers like Jared Tinkham. Just trying to get us some sick time to be able to take care of one, ourselves, and two, our loved ones, and that's what we're fighting for is the quality of life. Our thanks to Gio for that. And tonight, one of the best quarterbacks to ever play in NFL history is facing a civil lawsuit. Retired NFL great Brett Favre has been alleged to be part of a scheme to divert funds meant for low-income families to the construction of a volleyball facility at a university. ABC Steve Osinsami has the story. State officials say it's the largest case of public fraud in Mississippi's history. Some $77 million in welfare money spent on things that have nothing to do with needy families. And tonight, there are text messages from one of the state's most famous sons that allegedly have him caught up deep in the scandal. NFL Hall of Famer Brett Favre is facing questions tonight of whether he knowingly took $5 million of state welfare money to build a new volleyball facility for his daughter's team five years ago at her university and his alma mater. It's all laid out in court documents obtained by our affiliate WAPT in Jackson and text messages provided by an attorney representing former nonprofit director Nancy New, who has already pleaded guilty to fraud in the $77 million scheme 
Favre asks, if you were to pay me, is there any way the media can find out where it came from and how much? And in another message that names a former governor, Nancy New writes to Favre, wow, just got off the phone with Phil Bryant. He is on board with us. We will get this done. Bryant has long denied that as governor, he helped use welfare funds to pay for the new stadium. Favre puts it up. The former quarterback who broke all career passing records is a Green Bay Packer has already returned about $1.1 million that the state of Mississippi paid to him from that same welfare fund for motivational speeches that a state auditor says he never gave. Favre's attorneys are denying that he ever knew he was receiving welfare money. Steve Osinsami joins us now. And Steve, let's talk about Favre. Is he in any criminal trouble? At this point, he is not. He is not facing any charges, and neither is the former governor, for that matter. But Favre is being sued by the state of Mississippi for about $220,000 in what they're calling interest on the money that he got for those speeches that they said he never should have gotten. And one thing, Lindsay, we have to underline is that we are talking about federal welfare funds that a state officer is saying has been misspent that should have gone to people who live in the poorest state in the country. Lindsay. I know you'll be staying on this for us. Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you as always. Now to the war in Ukraine, where officials say their forces have now retaken more than 3,000 square miles from the Russians. And today, President Volodymyr Zelensky took a victory lap, posing with troops in recaptured towns. But the liberated cities are now revealing evidence of the violence they've faced by Russia's occupation. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge reports from Kharkiv, Ukraine tonight. Tonight, President Zelensky marching into Izium on a surprise victory trip to celebrate Ukraine's offensive. His officials now saying more than 3,000 square miles, including 380 communities, were liberated in just 10 days. Izium, once a key hub for the Russians, now the biggest prize of the Ukrainian advance. The president posing with troops, Zelensky comparing the evidence of war crimes here to Bucha in the initial phase of the war. The view is very shocking, but it's not shock for me because we, we began to see the same pictures from Bucha. Our team arriving tonight in Kharkiv, witnessing the devastation in Ukraine's second largest city for ourselves. Russia upped its strikes here in Kharkiv city when the Ukrainian offensive made sweeping gains. The Russian border is just a short drive from here, but now Ukraine controls this entire region. Tonight, a senior Western official saying the Ukrainian offensive in the northeast is over for now. Its forces focused on consolidating gains. The US playing a key role in planning the offensive, wargaming strategies with the Ukrainians. Tonight, the Russians firing back in southern Ukraine, hitting this dam in videos circulating online. But the war clearly going off course for Vladimir Putin. Even commentators on the Kremlin's own TV channels raising awkward questions. And some local Russian officials even calling for Putin to resign. With Russia gone from a large part of Ukraine, Ukrainian troops burning the Russian flag, ripping down Russian propaganda posters, with relatives now able to meet again. A local mayor sharing this video as he meets his mum, who lived for months under Russian occupation. I knew you'd return, she says. Well, Lindsay, in the newly liberated part of this region, Ukrainian officials have been digging up bodies. People they believe were killed by Russian soldiers saying traces of torture were found. Residents are coming forward saying they were detained and tortured. There was clearly a real climate of fear under Russian occupation. Now, sadly, you, the Ukrainians have real experience at investigating war crimes. We're all familiar with the name of Bucha, that town on the edge of Kiev, where the Russian soldiers committed widespread atrocities leading to hundreds, if not thousands of war crime cases which are being investigated and some of them have gone to court already. Ukrainian officials say this time around they're better equipped, they're better trained, they have better processes in place to start going around this region, Kharkiv, into those villages where they are discovering bodies, where they are hearing accounts of possible torture at the hands of Russian soldiers or authorities linked to the Russian state. 
So the Ukrainians say they are going to do this. They are determined that every case, every piece of evidence is turned up and they are getting international support, including from the US. Lindsay? In stark contrast, we love seeing those reunion videos. Our thanks to Tom. We turn now to the fallout after Senator Lindsey Graham proposed a federal ban on abortion after 15 weeks. The measure had divided Republicans. Some say that it should be left up to the states to decide. Meanwhile, Democrats are bashing the measure as an overreach, and it comes with less than two months now to the midterm elections. Here's ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott reporting in from Capitol Hill. Tonight, Republicans around the country forced to grapple with abortion, an issue they've been trying to avoid ever since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. Now it's front and center after a surprise move by one of their own. Senator Lindsey Graham introducing a bill to ban abortion nationwide at 15 weeks. If we take back the House and the Senate, I can assure you we'll have a vote on our bill. It's exactly what Republicans don't want to talk about. They see abortion as an issue that will help Democrats in November. In Arizona today, Senate candidate Blake Masters trying to change the subject. I'm here to talk about illegal immigration today. So you don't want to talk about that at all? I, I mean, I said yesterday, yeah, I'd support it. Hope it passes. It's not going to pass. In New Hampshire, just hours after becoming the Republican Senate nominee, Don Bolduck faced with questions about Graham's abortion bill. Well, here's the deal with that. I believe the federal government should stay out of it. Republicans saw what recently happened in Kansas. The conservative state overwhelmingly voted to protect abortion rights. It came after a surge in women registering to vote after the Supreme Court overturned Roe, according to Target Smart Insights, a Democratic data firm. What about messaging on this, Senator Graham? Do you think it's effective messaging? You need to stand up for what you believe, right? That's a good thing. But many of his colleagues say Republicans should be talking about something else. So I think the focus should be on inflation. Inflation is the big issue. Democrats clearly see an opportunity. What you're seeing there is a conflict within the Republican Party. They are digging a hole and they just keep digging it. Nancy Pelosi making her sentiments known there. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, you've been tracking the Republican Senate candidates with several now downplaying their views on abortions as the midterms approach. What are we seeing? Well, Lindsay, from Minnesota to Arizona, we have seen several Republican candidates really back away from their stances on the issue of abortion, some even scrubbing their campaign websites, removing their positions. But tonight, you do have one prominent Republican in Senator Graham's corner, and that is former Vice President Mike Pence, who says that he supports that nationwide ban, calling it profoundly more important than any short-term politics, Lindsay. And there's also another important measure I'm trying to make its way through the Senate, where Democrats are, are trying to enshrine the right to same-sex marriage at the federal level. Why has this issue come up and, and what's the status of the effort? Yes, Lindsay. So after Roe versus Wade was overturned, Democrats feel that other rights could also be at risk, not just the issue of abortion, but also same-sex marriage. So they want to protect these rights under federal law. But in order to do that, they need to get 10 Republicans on board in the Senate, and you know that could be a very tall order. Democrats are projecting a lot of optimism, but Senator, Senator Thune said today that he doesn't think that 10 Republicans will really rally around that bill. Either way, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has promised that it will come to the floor in the coming days, Lindsay. All right. Rachel Scott for us from Capitol Hill. Thanks so much. The mother of three small children found drowned on Coney Island Beach has been charged with their murder. She was found two miles away, wet, barefoot, and according to authorities, she would not communicate what her family is now telling investigators and the video, they say, is from that night. Here's Stephanie Ramos. <laughs> Tonight, police are accusing a New York City mother of murdering her three children. Sources tell ABC News police have surveillance video of 30-year-old Erin Murdy calmly walking her children into the ocean, not far from Coney Island's boardwalk before dawn on Monday. Seven-year-old Zachary, four-year-old Liliana, and a three-month-old baby boy named Oliver were found unconscious at the water's edge. They died at the hospital. A medical examiner says the three children died as a result of drowning. Authorities say they learned of the kids' disappearance from a relative who told police Murdy called her and told her she hurt the children. Police say when they found Murdy, she was in a nearly catatonic state and alone. She was wet, she was barefoot, um, and, and she was not um, communicative to the officers. 
Authorities using drones and boats finally located the children an hour and a half later, two miles away. As police search for a motive, officials tell ABC News detectives are looking into whether psychosis related to childbirth may have played a role. Our thanks to Stephanie for that. When we come back, the looming threat in the tropics. Some forecasts say that system that's strengthening, it could head toward the U.S. For years, he's told his story through stand-up, and now he's bringing it in a new series. Mo Ammer shame, shares how finding a humorous way to portray his family's immigration story has actually helped him heal. But first, the complex relationship between the royal family and the Commonwealth. Some are celebrating the Queen's life, but others say her reign cannot be divorced from Britain's history of colonialism. What some are pushing to receive from the crown. We head to the Caribbean next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers in Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I 5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24 7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on the tough questions with straightforward reporting. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. Firefighters in California are working to stop the mosquito fire as it threatens a town. It's already covering about 60,000 acres as it burns outside of San Francisco. It jumped a river on Tuesday and is now inching closer to the town of Forest Hill, threatening several structures, including a school. Firefighters are stationed across the city's border and working around the clock, trying to make sure the fire does not spread. For days now, tens of millions around the world have been saying goodbye to, in some cases, the only monarch they've ever known. But for some nations in the Commonwealth, grief is complex. There is mourning for Queen Elizabeth after a 70-plus year reign, while for others it's a reminder of long-standing and controversial ties to the royal family, ties that have sparked calls for reparations, a formal apology, and complete separation. Our Victor Akendo has a closer look at how these feelings are playing out, especially in the Caribbean. From Canada. Long live the king. To Australia. God save the king. To India. 
South Africa, and the Bahamas. God save the king. King Charles III becomes the head of the Commonwealth. Across the Caribbean, flags are at half-staff, and while not everyone is grieving, some join in to remember the queen as a strong female figure for her service and duty during her reign. The remembrance of her and all of her good that she's done, I think um, it's quite memorable to remember. I'm feeling a little sad because we all grew up knowing the queen. For others, her legacy is forever linked to Britain's colonial past. It's a little weird because, you know, she did encourage, promote, and basically stand for a lot of hateful and bad, terrible things. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Part of the problem for us in Jamaica is that this very monarch participated in our enslavement. She's the head of uh, the Church of England, and the Church of Eng England owns enslaved people in Barbados. An area of discomfort is the fact that the Queen, although she brought so much goods to her role, she's also a Queen that belongs to an institution that has a long history with slavery. Slavery that brought much destruction, death, and family conflicts to those countries. And so for many, it feels like the only way to really break away from that past is also to break away from the monarchy. Of the 56 Commonwealth nations, King Charles is head of state for 15 of them, known as the Commonwealth Realms, an association of nations that maintain similar values and cultural and economic ties with Britain. Eight of those are Caribbean countries, which still recognize the British monarch as their head of state, but the long-standing debate around cutting their ties to the monarchy is still very alive in the region. I think uh, this is the time to actually shed that uh, cloak of colonialism and try to see how we could forge and form our Belizean, our own Belizean identity. I personally don't see where England or the Queen actually gives us real support. The country seems like it's running on its own for the most part, so I'm all for us being a republic. Last year, Barbados removed the Queen as head of state and became a republic, with then Prince Charles attending the ceremony. And earlier this year, the Prince and Princess of Wales were met with protests on their Caribbean tour to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, which included visits to Jamaica, Belize, and the Bahamas. And Jamaica's Prime Minister, Andrew Holness, telling Prince William of the path they intend to follow. And, uh, we are moving on, and we intend to fulfill our true ambitions and destiny as an independent, uh, developed, prosperous country. I think we had already started to see somewhat of a domino effect for the conversation about many of the Commonwealth realm countries becoming republics after Barbados declared their full independence last year. But of course, the death of the Queen does accelerate that process a little further. I think many of the countries within the Commonwealth had been waiting for the moment where the Queen would pass and they would be able to move forward without causing offence to that impressive 70-year reign of the monarch. Antigua and Barbuda plan to hold a referendum within the next three years. People will go to the polls and vote on whether or not to become a republic. And the Bahamas considering the same. Thank is you. that on the table, that referendum? <laughs> For me, it is always, but I, again, again, it is our people who will have to decide. Calls not only to remove the monarch as head of state, but for Britain to grant reparations as well. We are no longer in a time where visiting school children and shaking hands is, um, is sufficient, that we have to talk about building a relationship that is based on an equal power dynamic, that recognize the power that our region brings to your region um, and try to level that power through reparations. Both King Charles and Prince William made unprecedented statements this past year. From the darkest days of our past and the appalling atrocity of slavery, which forever stains our history. I want to express my profound sorrow. Slavery was abhorrent and it should never have happened. But across the Caribbean Commonwealth, pro-reparations groups demand that the royals formally acknowledge the role their ancestors played in slavery and colonial rule. 
for the suffering and plundering of riches which contributed to the wealth of Britain and the monarchy. The British taxpayers just stopped paying the enslavers for the reparations that the enslavers received in 2015. Sorry is okay, but we need the acknowledgement that includes responsibility for your actions. So health, education, to make university education free, that's what we, should, we would love to see in the reparation payback. And we need an apology from King, King Charles III. He must apologize for slavery and the rule of the monarchy. Outside the Caribbean, calls for what is considered stolen history to be returned by the royal family, like the Great Star of Africa, the largest uncut diamond in the world, to go home to South Africa. And in India, the return of this diamond, which sits in the Queen's crown. A complex debate for these nations at the beginning of King Charles III's reign and the future of the Commonwealth. And in the Caribbean, a complicated feeling of grief, where many mourn the loss of a long-standing figure, while others focus on building what they consider a better future. The starting point for any kind of healing, for any kind of closure, is to admit that you did wrong or your ancestors did wrong and to tender an apology for that. I think it's a shame that it took this for the conversation to be reignited, but I have always been someone who believes that countries need to kind of set their own course and write their own destiny. Our thanks to Victor for that. Still ahead here on Prime, could we be nearing the end of the COVID pandemic? We certainly hope so. One major health organization is weighing in on that tonight. A podcast catapulted his case in the public eye, and he's pushed to be freed from prison. The new developments in Adnan Syed's attempts to get a new trial. Just how much money are the royals worth? We take a look at the vast fortune the queen left behind by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day about Lionel Messi, one of the best to ever do it. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. I'm Janine Teagues from Philadelphia. Girl, we already know who you are. Get to it. People think school starts when the kids get here, but it starts at development week. It's the calm before the storm. It's very zen, actually. It's all in the knee. You guys gotta see what's in the cafeteria. For real. A music icon, a baseball legend, a Hollywood game changer. What do these three superstars have in common? Do you realize what a trailblazer you are? They're celebrating Hispanic heritage in a big way. Que fantástico. This is your life. And we're going to start in the beginning. Oh, boy. No question off limits. <laughs> it's insane. It's amazing. And what led to this? You did it to me again. You always make me cry. Mi Gente, Groundbreakers and Changemakers, tonight at 10, 9 central on ABC. 
Welcome back, everyone. All the pomp and ceremony and grandeur of Great Britain's royal family has certainly been on display this past week. We're taking a look at the public's dedication to the country's longest-serving monarch and the vast fortune she leaves behind by the numbers. 30 hours. That's how long some people may stand in line to view Queen Elizabeth's coffin inside Westminster Hall. Preparations include 10 miles of, quote, queuing infrastructure and more than 500 portable toilets. As well-wishers bid farewell, some are also examining the royal inheritance. $28 billion. That's approximately how much the royal family's portfolio is reported to be worth. It's expected that King Charles will inherit the majority of it, and he'll pay zero inheritance tax. For the rest of the UK, it's 40%, but the royal family is exempt. The family's fortune includes the Crown Estate, $19.2 billion worth of luxurious London properties. While owned by the family, the estate is controlled by the British government, which collects the earnings and returns 25% of the profits back to the royals. That was $99 million last year. As prince, it's estimated that Charles grew his own portfolio by about 50%. His holdings are valued at around $1.9 billion. He's passed his estate on to Prince William. The royal family is not required to report on their earning and their exact wealth is unknown. And beyond all of this, the family has additional personal wealth that remains a closely guarded secret. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Three Iranian nationals accused of trying to hack into hundreds of computers here in the U.S. And it comes as the government issues a new warning about cybersecurity threats. Gloria Estefan looks back on the start of her groundbreaking career and tells us what it means to celebrate Hispanic heritage. But first, look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. So much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Outsiders come to Alaska to disappear or to reinvent themselves. Which is it? I came for a job. I'm a reporter. Her death is part of a pattern. And we need to show who's to blame. The cops, politicians, no one's going to help. Why? We're going to break this story. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. now resting inside Westminster Hall where she'll lie in state for four days. A moving 38-minute processional bringing the coffin through the streets of central London from Buckingham Palace. The somber scene playing out in front of an emotional crowd of tens of thousands. The king 
Princess Anne and Princess Andrew and Edward, steps behind the coffin. Behind the Queen's children, the King's sons, William and Harry. Inside, a short service before the royal family, literally and symbolically, handed over their beloved matriarch to the state for her funeral rites. Mourners waiting hours to see the procession in person. The head of the World Health Organization says the number of coronavirus deaths worldwide last week was the lowest reported in the pandemic since March 2020. We have never been in a better position to end the pandemic. We're not there yet, but the end is in sight. The director general is urging nations to vaccinate 100% of their high-risk groups and keep testing for the virus. A surprise in the sentencing trial of Florida school shooter Nicholas Cruz. Attorneys for Cruz unexpectedly resting their case after 11 total days of testimony and after calling only a fraction of their expected witnesses. That move led to a shouting match in court with the judge angrily calling the move the most uncalled for, unprofessional way to try a case. The trial will determine if Cruz receives a death sentence or life imprisonment after pleading guilty to murdering 17 people at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in 2018. That trial expected to resume September 27th. A teenage human trafficking victim who killed her accused rapist has been ordered to pay the man's family as part of her sentence. 17-year-old Piper Lewis pleaded guilty to charges that could have carried a 20-year sentence. A judge instead has given her five years probation and ordered her to pay $150,000 restitution. The judge cited an Iowa law which makes restitution mandatory. Officials have said Lewis was a runaway when she was trafficked to other men, including Zachary Brooks, who the then 15 year old Lewis stabbed 30 times after he allegedly raped her multiple times. Federal prosecutors are charging three Iranian men with running an international cyber ransom ring targeting businesses in the U.S. An indictment unsealed in Newark this morning claims the trio gained unauthorized access to hundreds of computer systems from October 2020 to last month. Prosecutors say the men demanded the victims pay thousands of dollars to get their data back. Their targets included small businesses, local governments, educational institutions, and even power companies. The men charged with hacking, conspiracy, computer hacking, and computer extortion. Could the man at the center of the popular serial podcast be getting a new trial? Prosecutors in Baltimore now say Adnan Saeed's 1999 conviction in the murder of Heyman Lee should be vacated due to a lack of DNA evidence in his case. In a new court filing, prosecutors said a reinvestigation of the case found evidence regarding the possible involvement of two other suspects. The motion made clear that prosecutors are not saying Saeed is innocent, just that he should have a new trial. Welcome back. A looming threat east of the Caribbean where a tropical depression is now forming has the potential to become the sixth named storm of the season, likely to be named Fiona by tomorrow. The forecast track would take it close to Puerto Rico by Saturday, but the models disagree on where it heads next, with some taking it to Bermuda and others potentially tracking close to Florida and the Gulf Coast. Now to our celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month and music legend Gloria Stefan talks about what her heritage means to her, her larger-than-life career, and making a place in music history. ABC News contributor Maria Elena Salina sat down with a global superstar for this in-depth look. One, two, three, four, come on, baby, say you love me, five, six, seven. She brought a seismic shift to the music industry with her Cuban sounds and catapulted crossover success for some of the biggest international stars, staying true to her roots and never forgetting her querida tierra. When did you realize this is what I want to do for a living? I didn't feel the need to do it for other people. And then I met Emilio. They had to change the Miami Latin boys because they it did. It wasn't just boys anymore. Exactly. Gloria and the Miami Sound Machine burst onto the scene with hits like Let It Loose in Conga, which fused percussion and Latin beats. Come on, shake your body, baby, do the conga. No, you can't control yourself any longer. Feel the rhythm of the music getting stronger. Don't you fight it till you try to do the conga beat. 
They thought that it wasn't going to be the hit because they thought it was too Latin sounding. But there's nothing more motivating to Emilio and me than the word no. What does being a Latina, a Cuban Americana, mean to you? The values that this country has instilled in me are just as important as the ones that my mother clung to and made sure she passed on to me. And I always say I was replanted in American soil, but I was watered with Cuban sun and Cuban water. So you have countless Grammys, Presidential Medal of Honor. I remember when we got the Presidential Medal of Freedom that it's the first time that a couple ever received it together. All I could think of was my dad. The Medal of Freedom, which is the reason he brought us to this country, and to be receiving that it was, wow, it was a big deal. It must have been very special for you. You did it to me again! No, I didn't do yeah, it. Yeah, you always make me cry. Yeah. Lots of emotion tonight. Soul of a Nation presents Mi Gente, Groundbreakers and Changemakers, a special celebrating three trailblazing figures in the Hispanic and Latino community, spotlighting music icon Gloria Stefan, Star Wars actor Diego Luna, and Hall of Famer David Ortiz on their impact and influence on the world. Tune in tonight at 10, 9 central on ABC News and tomorrow on Hulu. We know the old setting saying that laughter is the best medicine and Palestinian American comedian Mo Ammer is turning his sometimes painful refugee experience into laughter. Stand up routines and now a highly successful freshman series on Netflix. The first season is a love letter to his diverse upbringing hometown of Houston and family who all took this journey to citizenship right by his side. Our Trevor Alt sat down with Mo for a personal conversation on work, life and everything in between. I've never been to Palestine. I don't have citizenship there. I don't have citizenship here. I'm like a refugee free agent. Would you like to try some chocolate hummus? You say chocolate hummus? You just insulted my grandmother. The autobiographical, semi-autobiographical show, you. Mo. This is a story you've wanted to tell for quite some time. Yeah, it's the, you know, it's a refugee story coming to America. I've never seen it with a comedic spin. It's about a story about belonging, a fish out of water story, uh, someone who works under the table to have to provide for their family. Although it's a refugee story, it's a Sahili story, it's an immigrant story, it's a universal one. Anybody that struggles, that tries to take care of their family, is, uh, you know, hustling day and night. Trying to trying to make it happen for them, and then you know along the way losing themselves, you know also, and not dealing with whatever really uh, pains them spiritually. Yeah. So you uh, you're Palestinian descent. Correct. Your family fled Kuwait when you were nine. Correct. You landed in Houston. Yep. You had that Netflix special, Muhammad in Texas. <laughs> Correct. Once you speak another language, you realize you realize that the English language is just like a newborn, you know. <laughs> You said finding the humor in immigration is very easy. Yeah. It doesn't sound like a barrel of laughs, but uh, it <laughs> seems like you found it. How did you, was it natural to you? Yeah, I think it was like an immediate defense mechanism uh, to make fun of a ridiculous situation. And it's also like a therapeutic thing where it's painful. So you have to find the comedy in it. Like, when we're writing the show. I was like, man, we really got to make sure we spread this out. It was probably the hardest thing to do. I mean, you're an American citizen now, yeah. right? Oh, How yeah. long did that process take? It took me 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. It's very easy to get lost in that because there's a thing that happens when you come to the States and you, you speak English the way I do. People are like, well, how are you not a citizen? You're, you don't have an accent. Like, well, what did you expect? Well, I do have an accent. It's an American accent. Right. We just started off with a little snake venom in there. So why aren't you an American? It's a tough thing to juggle. Uh, let's talk about Houston. Mm -hmm. I really love Houston. I believe most diverse major city in America. That's correct. Uh, you grew up there. You shot this there. Too, Absolutely. Right? Was there ever a discussion about shooting it somewhere else? Never. Houston. I'm very proud of it. It's a city that embraced me, that raised me. Uh, I absolutely love it. And I think that it's a travesty that never been a TV show filmed there. Mm -hmm. I always found it to be really odd that Houston has never been portrayed on television like this before. And Houston is still home for you. Absolutely. Did I, I, I believe I just read that there was a terrible fire at an apartment complex and yeah. you took everybody in a shopping spree. It's important, man. You can't film something out of A-Leaf and you see something like that. And, I mean, I don't know how much I can do, but the things that you can contribute to, I think is really important. Sure. I'm a big, big believer of helping out your community and these small 
little acts will create something big over time mm -hmm. and to try to fix something that's really far away from you is 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 good also but i think you need to start at home first and and build out from there you've been talking about your life in your stand-up for years it, that's that's one thing but like depicting your family in a mm -hmm. show is another thing i'm sure that there were a lot of conversations like with your mother with your brother about how to go about that. Well, I had deep discussions with my mother, you know, uh, in just having these talks about the show, which I was oh, my TV great. mom and my brother named Samir. Uh, my, and Samir is such a special character. You got enough room in your car for 30 pounds of halal chicken? You know, the fact that he's uh, on the spectrum. The TV Samir took a lot from my brother, but also he made it his own in such a special and unique way. And it's really beautiful what he did with it. I couldn't be more proud of him and, and what he's done with it. <laughs> Since she really loves your hair. Thank you. She wants you to take your shoes off, but she wishes you weren't Polish. A lot of it was on Omar, and he did such an exceptional job with it. And he did the research, he did the time. He's actually on the spectrum himself. So it was one of those situations that worked well for him in that way. And he, I wanted him to take the lead on that. Wow. In a moment, I was like, whoa, was like, this, this is really wild how it's all working out. And, and it's a beautiful thing how authentic it is, how grounded it is. And that's how people connect to it, right? Like it's creating something that's true. You keep thinking that you have to do all this stuff alone and you don't. You got us and you got your family. Were you trying to make something that you wish you could have watched when you were a teenager? It's been, when I first started stand up in the mid 90s, it was like a 14 year old, I realized very quickly there wasn't anything on television that showed us in a positive light or even like, forget about even positively, like show something where you can connect to. It was so interesting, like it doesn't exist. Making the show was, was really, really important to have a Palestinian family that everyone can relate to. This is really a universal story of, of struggle, of being spiritually torn, trying to figure out your way, and, and making a lot of mistakes while you do it, and hopefully learning from them. It's also, it's really kind of an incredible feat of writing that you can balance that with like Hamas jokes. Yeah. Uh, that are yeah. all funny. Like, the comedy yeah. is great, too. So, hummus, and, hummus. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm from Ohio. I am, ha. I'm Midwest. Ha. Hummus? No, that's not ha. Ha is another letter, bro. Okay, so... Ha, you know what? The scene of you is over. Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew this was going <laughs> to no, happen. No, no, no. it's hummus, hummus. Okay. Ha, it's a hate. Hey, just... I'd rather just say hummus at this point. Hummus? Yeah, that's better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. Tease it, tease it. Say it as you that's like. That's fair, fair enough. It. It's been great talking to you. The critical reception, to, I'm sure it's got to be pleasing to see how people are responding to it. Yeah. Mo, great Thank to meet you. you. No, pleasure's mine. Thank you, Charles. Thanks for being here. So what was it there? Hamas? <laughs> Our thanks to Trevor for that. You can stream the entire first season of Mo right now on Netflix. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, the Fab Four together, Prince Harry and Meghan holding hands, the future king and his wife ahead of them as Britain's Queen Elizabeth arrived from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall, where she is now lying in state. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, R. Kelly convicted again. The charges the jury found him guilty of in this latest case. Plus, thousands are waiting in line for hours to say a final goodbye to the queen as her coffin sits in Westminster Hall. Now a friend of the new head of state is telling us what we could expect under King Charles's reign. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. 
Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Disgraced R&B singer R. Kelly has been found guilty by a jury in Chicago of child pornography charges. Kelly is already serving a 30-year sentence for a previous conviction for racketeering and sex trafficking, which was the first time after years of accusations that he was held criminally responsible. He could now face another 90-year sentence. The state of California is suing Amazon, accusing the online retail giant of anti-competitive behavior. Behavior. The state's attorney general says because of Amazon, families have paid more for their online purchases because of restrictive contracts, barring third-party merchants from offering lower prices on other sites, including their own websites. California wants to end the practice and have Amazon pay back some of its gains. And the billionaire founder of Patagonia clothing company, Yvonne Chunar, is giving his company away, announcing the outdoor retailer will now be owned by two new nonprofit entities dedicated to protecting the planet. All profits from the company, about $100 million a year, will now be used in the fight against climate change. Patagonia released a statement saying the Earth is now our shareholder. Next to the Queen's final journey and the remarkable scene in London as a city and country says farewell. The Queen's casket left Buckingham Palace for the final time today. And tonight, the line of mourners waiting to pay their final respects stretches on for miles. Our chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel reports. Tonight, Queen Elizabeth II leaving Buckingham Palace, her childhood home, one last time. She was head of a family, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, but also head of a nation. And now the British people have a chance to say a last goodbye to their Queen. At 2.22 exactly, a gun salute, as the cortege made its sombre march to Westminster. The toll of Big Ben marking every solemn minute. Against a deep blue sky, even the plane stopped flying for a few brief moments. As the Queen's coffin, draped in the royal standard, topped with the imperial state crown, was led from the palace on a gun carriage. That crown, steeped in royal history, worn by a young Elizabeth on her coronation day almost 70 years ago, and now marking the end of her historic reign. King Charles walking directly behind his mother as the procession moved past thousands of mourners, faces of love and loss. The weight of this moment etched on the new king's face and following behind his son, Prince William, now the heir to the throne, and Prince Harry alongside, a family in sadness and reflection. The two brothers walking together, a reminder of that heartbreaking procession 25 years ago when as young boys they walked behind their mother's casket. And Princess Anne, who's been with her mother on every step of this final journey, marching side by side with her brother, the King. And as the coffin passed by, a ripple of spontaneous applause moved through the crowd. The cortege arriving at the Palace of Westminster. The choir singing Psalm 139 as the Queen was brought to rest in Westminster Hall. The extended royal family there, the Queen Consort at the King's side, one by one pausing before the casket. The Queen will lie here in state 
until her funeral Monday. Nearly a million people expected to pay their respects to the only monarch until now most of them have ever known. Our thanks to Ian for that. As Great Britain says farewell to Queen Elizabeth, we're learning more about King Charles. Our next guest knows him well. Lord Simon Woolley built a relationship with the new monarch after advising him on the Black Lives Matter movement. Lord Woolley, we thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, first off, let's just find out how you got to know King Charles. Well, I've known him for over 20 years, but increasingly during the Black Lives Matter unprecedented protests, after the death of George Floyd and the tens of thousands of people that took to the streets here in the UK that wanting uh, persistent race inequality addressed in an effective way. The Prince Charles invited me to his house, Clarence House in London, to talk about how we give hope and how we give opportunities to young black kids, actually not just young black kids, young black and white kids who are on the street protesting about systemic race inequality. And what was that first conversation like? I'm curious what he asked you about and, and what your impressions were afterward. Well, I'd spoken on many rallies and meetings saying that this was a time for leadership. This was a time for white allyship. And it got back to him that I was a person that he needed to engage with. So I thought we'd be meeting on Zoom it was the time of COVID where everything was locked down, but no. He said, I want to meet you face to face at my house and we can have an adult conversation about how our institutions are working against black people, how we give hope, how he as then the future king can show the leadership that I and others were demanding of him and others. And I have to say, that the conversation was scheduled, Lindsay, for 30 minutes. It lasted two hours. Oh, wow. And then we had further meetings and further meetings, and we got other people involved. So it was a kind of adult conversation that you would expect from somebody that begins to, in no small measure, get the enormity of the challenge and says to themselves, what's my role? And so you feel that he gets it. I think it gets it more than most. Um, I mean, a few a few months later, uh, he came to, to my college here behind me, which is a prestigious Cambridge University college. And he said to me, I need to come to your college to show support to you because of what you stand for. Team in diversity, race inequality, equality of opportunity. And I think this is the hallmark of, I hope, is a, a modern king. And you've brought up the word equity uh, a few times. And I'm curious, as you've built your relationship with him, how big of a priority are issues of uh, equality and, and fairness for him? I think it's part of his DNA. And I think it's part of the things that most people have not understood. I think there's two things that he cares about most of all in his life. Uh, one is uh, the climate, uh, the climate challenge, which he's been speaking about this before it was even fashionable 50 years ago. And two is equality, which is, you might say, Lindsay, is kind of ironic from one of the most privileged men on the planet. And yet, having worked with him, having spoken to him, that I know it's true. We, we would be in meetings with uh, 100 people, and he would make a, he would make a beeline to me and he would lean in and say, Lord, Lord Woolley, uh, how can I help? How, how can I do more? You will know, Lindsay, there's still questions to be asked by the, the royal family with his past involvement in the enslavement of Africans. We cannot change history. History is what it is. What we can do is build for a better future. I'm curious. Um, if you anticipate that that kind of conversation uh, might happen, 
um, the direction now uh, that, that you would tell the king that he has to go with regard to race relations and, and bringing people together? Because, you know, there, mm -hmm. there are certain people who believe, even after that, that interview that, that Harry and Meghan did with, with Oprah Winfrey, that, that you know, they're, they're racist. And, and of course, you know, it, it's hard to, to group a, a bunch of people, right, with that kind of label. But, but what will be, you know, what you whisper into the king's ear as far as trying to move the meter beyond that? The, the stuff that you, you mentioned about the family, you know, it is, I would argue, a missed opportunity that, the, that Harry and Meghan are not central to the royal family because, to me, that is 21st century modern Britain, a monarchy that, that is black and white. Um, but they have chose to go their own way. That needs to be respected. But I hope that in, in small but significant measure, that comes back to the fore, because in effect it will show a modern monarchy that is literally multiracial, that, is, that does have a voice and speaks to who we are today. Lord Simon Woolley, such a pleasure to talk with you. Could ask you a number of questions. Really appreciate uh, your time tonight. Thank you. Now to the war in Ukraine, where officials say their forces have now retaken more than 3,000 square miles from the Russians. And today, President Volodymyr Zelensky took a victory lap, posing with troops in recaptured towns. But the liberated cities are now revealing evidence of the violence they've faced by Russia's occupation. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge reports from Kharkiv, Ukraine tonight. Tonight, President Zelensky marching into Izium on a surprise victory trip to celebrate Ukraine's offensive. His officials now saying more than 3,000 square miles, including 380 communities, were liberated in just 10 days. Izium, once a key hub for the Russians, now the biggest prize of the Ukrainian advance. The president posing with troops, Zelensky comparing the evidence of war crimes here to Bucha in the initial phase of the war. The view is very shocking, but it's not shock for me because we, we began to see the same pictures from Bucha. Our team arriving tonight in Kharkiv, witnessing the devastation in Ukraine's second largest city for ourselves. Russia upped its strikes here in Kharkiv city when the Ukrainian offensive made sweeping gains. The Russian border is just a short drive from here, but now Ukraine controls this entire region. Tonight, a senior Western official saying the Ukrainian offensive in the northeast is over for now. Its forces focused on consolidating gains. The US playing a key role in planning the offensive, wargaming strategies with the Ukrainians. Tonight, the Russians firing back in southern Ukraine, hitting this dam in videos circulating online. But the war clearly going off course for Vladimir Putin. Even commentators on the Kremlin's own TV channels raising awkward questions. And some local Russian officials even calling for Putin to resign. With Russia gone from a large part of Ukraine, Ukrainian troops burning the Russian flag, ripping down Russian propaganda posters, with relatives now able to meet again. A local mayor sharing this video as he meets his mum, who lived for months under Russian occupation. I knew you'd return, she says. Love to see those reunion videos. Our thanks to Tom for that. Back here at home, our nation's railroad system could, in essence, grind to a halt as soon as Friday. A looming strike, if not averted, could have far-reaching implications for our supply chain and the price of goods. Amtrak is already moving to cancel routes, and farmers across the country are concerned. Our transportation correspondent, Gion Benitez, reports. Tonight, a race against the clock to stop a supply chain crisis and travel nightmare, with 60,000 rail workers threatening to strike tomorrow at midnight. 
Amtrak now canceling its long distance trips on 14 routes. Nearly all of its trains outside the Northeast Corridor would be impacted with possible shutdowns of local commuter lines. I was like, oh my God, how am I going to get to work next week? Nearly a third of the freight in this country is moved by rail. Everything from oil to cars to crops. Farmers like Tom Waters are worried. There's a lot of fear. We need government to step in and do something about this. He needs to move wheat out of grain elevators to make room for beans and corn before they die in the fields. Americans are already facing sky high prices and experts warn a strike could cripple a stressed supply chain. It means that you could see empty shelves at your store where goods that were supposed to get there just could not get there. If it goes on for any length of time, it starts to spin out of control fairly quickly. Railroad companies have shed thousands of workers in recent years with profits soaring. Washington trying to broker a deal. The main area of disagreement is that there's no sick leave for the, the workers, and that's a problem. Workers like Jared Tinkham. Just trying to get us some sick time to be able to take care of one, ourselves, and two, our loved ones, and that's what we're fighting for is the quality of life. Our thanks to Gio for that. The mother of the girl critically injured in the DWI crash involving then Kansas City Chiefs coach Britt Reed is speaking out with new details about what happened that fateful night. ABC's Victor Kendo is back with more. I just remember looking in the mirror, seeing him come in, like just full speed coming, and then all of a sudden everybody was stocked out. For the first time, Felicia Miller is sharing horrific details about the night Britt Reed, son of Kansas City Chiefs head coach Andy Reed, crashed into her car, leaving her daughter Ariel critically injured with a traumatic brain injury. And I was like, oh my God, he's about to hit us, and then boom. Did you have a second to try to protect your daughter? No, it just happened. Else? No, I couldn't because it happened so fast. Miller speaking exclusively with ABC News just days after Reed pleaded guilty to driving while impaired as part of a deal for a reduced sentence. Anything to say before court this morning? Uh, no, thank you. The maximum prison time he'll now face? Four years. He's just getting a slap on the wrist. If anybody else had did that, if we did that, any of us hit his car, being drunk, hitting his car and injured one of his kids, we've been in jail. I think the family is upset because they perceive a different system of justice for those who have privilege and those who don't, those who have privilege and those people from the victim's community. Reed was an assistant coach for the Chiefs at the time of the crash in February 2021, just three days before his team played in the Super Bowl. EMS arriving on scene, we have one child possibly seriously injured. Reed's pickup truck slamming into Felicia's car and her cousin's, which had broken down near the team's training facility. Both cars were pulled over on the shoulder. Three vehicles involved, dark colored sedan, a silver SUV, and a different vehicle. One vehicle is flipped. According to a search warrant application obtained by ABC News, an officer on scene reported smelling a moderate odor of alcoholic beverages emanating from Reed. He told the officer he'd had two to three drinks and was on the prescription drug Adderall. This image from the wreck shows the back seat where Ariel was sitting totally crushed. I don't hear my baby at all, and I just hear Julie crying, and I'm just like freaking out, freaking out, and then finally uh, we find her because she's buried under the seats because, you know, all the seats done broke in the car. She was just trapped underneath some seats in yeah, the car? Yeah, yeah, and then when I, when I got her out the car, she was stiff. Like, if you see, like, this, this, my arm, your arm's just stiff. She was just stiff like a board. Ariel rushed to the hospital, spending nearly two weeks in a coma. When she did finally wake up, what was that like for you? Oh, it's like, oh my God, my baby, God heard me, my baby woke up. I was really relieved, but it was so, she, she didn't, she didn't, at the time when she woke up, she didn't know nothing. She didn't know who I was. So as I'm trying to touch my baby, like, hey, baby, she was, you know, moving away. And her she didn't eyes, recognize you? No. She didn't recognize me. Felicia says Ariel doesn't remember the crash, and her daughter, who loves to dance, has had to relearn many things. Details about Ariel's condition are limited because of a legal agreement. In November, the Chiefs worked out a payment plan for her medical care. How is Ariel doing? She's seven now, and yeah, she is back in school. That was a bit of a relief, but it's still, it was still difficult. It still is difficult sending her back. Ariel's road to recovery is long, but her family says she is improving every day. They wear these Ariel Strong shirts in support. She's been strong through the whole, the whole last almost two years from her. She woke up through the coma and, you know, being strong through the hospital till now, just being strong.
Our thoughts certainly with Ariel and her family. Our thanks to Victor for that. Still to come, caught on camera the moment a glacier collapsed. What caused it to cave in? More than a million school children are estimated to have experienced homelessness. Poverty and child welfare expert David Ambrose tells us how his new book highlights what he says are failures in our systems and what needs to be changed. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world. Chinese leader Xi Jinping on his first foreign trip in almost 1,000 days since before the pandemic. He arrived in Uzbekistan ahead of a regional summit where he'll meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin. It's their first in-person meeting since the invasion of Ukraine. Sweden's center-left prime minister stepped down today after her party lost the leadership in parliamentary elections. A right-wing coalition that includes a nationalist anti-immigration party won a narrow majority. It's a major shift for the country, which has a decades-long history of welcoming refugees. And in Chile, record high winter temperatures and heavy rain have caused a glacier to cave. The dramatic collapse was caught on camera at a national park in the Patagonia region. Local experts say climate change is impacting glaciers throughout the region. In 2020, the National Center for Homeless Education estimated that 1.2 million children enrolled in public schools were experiencing or had previously experienced homelessness. National poverty and child welfare expert David Ambrose tells us his personal experience in and out of the poverty cycle in a place called home. He recalls growing up homeless, then being systematically disregarded and unprotected within foster care. Ambrose has been recognized by former President Obama as an American champion of change, and he's pushed for social responsibility and at Walt Disney Television and currently as head of community engagement at Amazon. David, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to start off by quoting the book. You write of your childhood, I live in a cycle, homelessness, hunger, housing, welfare, and homelessness again. Uh, just talk to us a bit about how you ultimately were able to get out of this cycle yeah. and, and why this has been so important to you that you're dedicating your, your life's work in part to this. I, I think our poverty programs are so dis disaggregated. We reach into the water and pull a person up that's drowning, and then we let go once they gasp the breath. And then another program pulls them up, but they go back in. And my family went through that cycle relentlessly. And we have to streamline it and help families lift up out of poverty. Two thirds of the kids entering foster care are there because of neglect, which is a euphemism for poverty. We can do better. We can preserve families if we chip away at this 
issue that never seems to end. And one more quote here. You write, I know that I'm not going to law school for me. I'm going with the determination to help them, to help kids like me off the streets to make sure that they are never put through a system that grinds away hope. Yeah. So I, I'm curious what laws you feel need to be reformed in order to better serve and, and protect those who are in foster care. What I often ask people to do is to close their eyes and imagine if their child had to go into foster care tomorrow. And what does that system look like? Let's develop that system. And whatever laws need to be put in place, let's do that. I think there's very low hanging fruit. So for instance, how do we recruit more foster parents into the system so that social workers aren't desperate for a placement? Let's provide them health insurance as if they were federal employees. You remove one of the biggest obstacles for middle class people to do this work by addressing their core needs. There is a policy way to move this forward, but it's not gonna happen unless the public cares enough. But I am curious about yeah. those people who are maybe on the fence and they yeah. think, oh, I don't know, is my house suitable enough? Absolutely. How would you define that? I think all of us start that question from why can't I? Mm. So many things in our face every day, a homeless person on the street asking us for money, all these challenges we have as people. And what I'd ask folks to do is not start with the reasons listed out in your mind, why can't you? Why should you and how could you? And it may not be right for you to become a foster parent. That's fine. There's all these other ways you can contribute. I'm running a campaign right now called Donate Your Small Talk. So instead of asking someone when you get in the elevator how their weekend was, no one cares. Tell them a fun fact about foster care, like, um, do you know Steve Jobs was adopted out of foster care? Or uh, do you know Marilyn Monroe was a foster kid? Say something interesting about this topic. That's the lowest level, is to care. Educate yourself, all the way up to fostering which I hope people will consider. 400,000 children currently in the foster care system here. It's believed that 117,000 mm -hmm. of those have disabilities. Yeah. And many people said when Roe v. Wade uh, was mm -hmm. overturned in June that that was gonna overwhelm the system. So I'd kind of just like to get a status check yeah. as far as where we are now and what are some preventive measures we can put into place. Uh, not since 1999 in a presidential debate has anyone mentioned the word child poverty. Uh, we've talked about coal miners and there's 424,000 children, well outnumber that population, but we don't talk about it. Um, the system is already overwhelmed, so it's not a matter of overwhelming it further. The boat has holes and it's sinking. Every time foster care comes up, it's often in the shadow of other controversial issues like the opioid crisis. A lot of those kids went into foster care from those families. The separation of children at the border, those kids went into foster care. The system is always in the shadow of these other controversial topics. And because of that shadow, it never gets the sunlight it needs. And imagine if your kid was going into it. Let's create that system you want for your child. It's overwhelmed right now. We don't have to wait for more kids to come. I, I, I do want to just ask you in the last minute that we have, you had talked about how you felt unprotected in yeah. the foster care system. You have now become a foster parent yourself. What made you decide to do that? Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, I fell in love with this young person. He came into my office and I often will have conversations. Folks can do this as a volunteer thing to mentor kids. I would do conversations with foster kids for my sister who's a social worker. And he came into my office and as one does, this bright child with all the potential in the world, um, I just fell in love and, and I saw him and I saw his pain, I saw his future and my heart broke and I wanted to be part of his life and I wanted him to have a different trajectory. And it went from mentorship to deep mentorship to all of a sudden I'm his foster father. I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> um, and he's the love of my life. I can imagine that you have changed his trajectory. David, we thank you so much for sharing your thank story, you. for coming on the show. You can purchase A Place Called Home wherever books are sold. And still to come, he once dominated on the football field, but now he's running after a new dream, the college athlete's next play. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now.
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Ready for a little GMA-ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! Cold case in Alaska. She went missing two years ago. Her death is part of a pattern. Another missing murdered Native women. And we need to show who's to blame. You show up and start asking questions, be careful. When it gets dark, it can get dark. Pace yourself. I'm gonna break this story. You mean we? Out of the shadows. Finally tonight, after dominating the football field, a successful college football player is now chasing down a new dream, becoming a surgeon. Reporter Cameron Polum from our partner station KNXB takes us to Tempe, Arizona for our local lowdown. I'd be sitting here lying and saying that I don't miss it. I mean, I look at the grass here and and then I look at this beautiful stadium and, you know, I miss it every day. Inside Sun Devil Stadium, there's no shortage of memories for Kyle Williams to look back on. For the former wide receiver, football has been a part of his life since as long as he can remember. Football was 18 years of my life. I mean, I grew up on it every single day. I worked at it, did push-ups at night. I'm catching footballs off the, you know, the, the jugs and machine. His dedication landed him a scholarship here and eventually an opportunity in the NFL. It's that same dedication he's now taking into his next journey. What made you say to yourself, you know what? It's time to put all of myself into this rather than football. Coming to grips with that reality that, you know, football may be done for me and, you know, really trying to cultivate a passion outside of football was important. Well, at ASU, Kyle studied biomedical engineering, but it was a relationship he shared with ASU team physician Anakar Chabra that now has him hoping to trade in his uniform for a white coat. First saw Kyle as a freshman football player. He came to see me after a game where he had fallen onto his shoulder and hurt his AC joint. The orthopedic surgeon says it didn't take long to realize he was different. Most kids just wanted to know, when can I go back to play? Kyle thought a little deeper. He wanted to know the pathology of his injury. Why did this happen? How can I prevent it? The inquisitive young man would later become Dr. Shabra's protege and is now a first year med student at the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine, already drawing parallels to his days on the gridiron. You see a patient who comes in and they, and they present this clinical vignette and you're trying to figure out what's going on. So you game plan, right? You, you look at the labs and, and you talk with your team. While he has a long road ahead, it's a route this former receiver is thrilled to be taking. I'm excited now to be able to return to the sport at a different capacity, right? So I may not be the one catching the balls, but I may be able to help someone else return to catching balls, to catching touchdowns. And, and for me, that's, that's equally fulfilling. Calling quite an audible there. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.